As a parent or mentor, you have the awesome opportunity to help a young person build a future. So if the future they want is in the military, take the time to learn more at todaysmilitary.com because their success tomorrow begins with your support today. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess. Ah, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... <laughs> records of London's Old Bailey and our own high criminal courts, and I've come to realize that if one seeks justice, the law courts are not always a guarantee. Then it occurred to me, what better way to improve the present than to point a finger at the past? So, here goes. This isn't right, Margaret. Spying on the man who's working for you? What's he doing with those boxes? Our best silk shirt. But he's just piling them up to write down the inventory. Six boxes? They're worth about 50 pounds. Now, where is he taking them? Well, that door leads to the back alley. Edgar, if you don't do something about this, I will. Our mystery drama, The Hanging Judge. A case from the actual records of Old Bailey was dramatized especially for the Mystery Theater by Jean Frederick Lewis and stars Court Benson and Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The wages of sin is death says the New Testament. But not always. Sometimes death can be the pay of the innocent. You hear about miscarriage of justice as if it were a train you got on and off and got off at the wrong destination. And you might say the conductor of such a train is the judge. One of the most notorious in history was the hanging judge of Holborn. Ironic then that as our tale begins, he's lying in bed suffering from a heart attack his days passing like a dream before him. Who hadn't heard of Edgar Brown's haberdashery in fashionable Chelsea? I myself, a judge of the circuit court, always stopped in at Brown's when I was in London for a silk scarf or a shirt, a pair of fine gloves or what have you, as did many of the fashionable gentry. Just Edgar Brown and one assistant. I always thought it was a very well-run, excellent business. Margaret, I, Margaret, I think I'm losing my shirt. What are you talking about, Edgar? Losing my shirt means I am losing money. But how can that be? You have no want of customers. No, but I have a want of profits. Take a look at these books. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't bother yourself, my dear. It would rattle your brain. It's too depressing. Even I can't understand it. We should be showing a profit. But I, I'm hardly breaking even. I don't suppose your rattle-brained wife might be able to help. <sighs> no, I, I don't see how. You know, we from County Clare have a sixth sense, a seventh sense. Let me come downstairs starting tomorrow and work in the shop. But do, do you mean that I should let Jack Powell go? Of course not. I work right alongside and no one need know I'm your wife. <laughs> but Margaret, what is the point of it? If I'm not feeling on Powell's salary, how can that help? Now, couldn't you use an extra body, especially tomorrow when you're going to do your inventory? Oh, oh I suppose so, yes. Couldn't you use someone extra in the shop, say, to handle the small purchases, ring up the cash register, and that kind of thing? But the jerk does that. No, oh, no, I don't suppose he'd mind. You need someone to keep an eye on that shirt you keep losing. <laughs> Oh, 
Oh, Maggie, Maggie, Maggie. Lead me to my chair, my girl. Oh, I know when you're tired, Edgar, you always call me Maggie. And I should think you would be. Do you know what time it is? I came up to cook dinner at six. He said you'd be right up. It's nine o'clock. But we haven't finished the inventory yet. No. I left Jack down there. Yeah, you should have asked him to come upstairs for a bit of supper with us. Yes, I did, as a matter of fact. But you said he wanted to get on with it. <sighs> Margaret, you were of great help today. Then I think the customers liked you. The cold muttons on the table help yourself when you've a mind to. <laughs> Inventory taking always takes longer than one thinks. Now, that's the advantage of having an older man like Jack. <laughs> he may not have much of an education, but he does have a sense of responsibility. It was a lucky day for us when Jack wandered into the shop looking for work. Lucky for him, you mean. How a man can get to be 50 and have no skills, no profession, nothing to rely on is beyond me. Well, even where I was born, everybody was a farmer. Well, you know, he's had a hard time of it, Jack has. Jobs aren't easy to come by, especially with his kind of wife. Yeah, he was telling me. Do they have children? No, 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 thank goodness, no. But that wife of his is always after him for nice things. You know, he said to me today, no matter what he brings home for her, it's never enough. He's never been able to properly provide for her. Well, I have no patience with the likes of him. Yeah. But a moment ago, you said... Why didn't I invite the man up here for a bit of supper? Only to keep an eye on him. Margaret, what is the matter with you? One day you work downstairs in the store and already you've taken a dislike to the man. I don't trust him. I'm not absolutely sure, mind you, but I have a very good idea why your profits aren't what they should be. What? You have? This morning, when he rang up a sale, three shillings, four pence it was, I saw him slip the money into his pocket. You saw that? Then he looked up, saw that I was watching him, and quickly put the money into the cash drawer. I can't believe that. Edgar, can you wait your supper a few minutes? Oh, yes, I suppose so. If we go downstairs to the first landing, there's that little window that overlooks the shop. Hmm? Come down with me. Can you see him down there? This, this isn't right, Margaret. Spying on a man who's working for you... What's he doing with these boxes? There are the silk shirts. He's just probably piling them together to write down the inventory. Six boxes? It's worth about 50 pounds. So he's tying them up with string. Edgar, where is he taking them? That door leads to the back alley. Why is he taking brand new shirts out the back alley? Margaret, don't be so suspicious. But of course, that's it. The boxes are empty. He's putting them out there so the trash man will take them away. Now... He's come back into the shop. Mr. Brown! Oh, Mr. Brown! Uh, yes, Jack. What is it? Pretty much finished up the inventory, sir. I'll be on my way now. Good night, sir. Uh, yes, good night, Jack. Uh, thanks for staying so late. See you in the morning. Edgar, I want you to go downstairs this minute, go out into the alley, and see if those boxes are still there. <laughs> Now, Mr. Brown, would you care to make a statement? I would, Inspector. I would, too. There we have one at a time, please. Sir, this man, Jack Powell, he stayed late at my shop making up our inventory, and I saw him going up our back alley carrying away half a dozen of our finest shirts. Silk, genuine silk. I ran after him, chasing him across Russell Square, and I shouted for him to stop, and he happened to run right in the arms of a police officer, and that was it. Hmm. You're preferring charges? Of course we are. Well... But I don't see how we cannot. The man was obviously stealing. Well, after we locked him up, we obtained a warrant and searched his premises. His wife. Was she there? The moment we arrived, she ran out the door. We examined the premises and recovered some merchandise which we have laid out in the next room. Would you and Mrs. Brown care to follow me, please? We've laid most of it out on the tables. The jackets and suits appear to be brand new. The smaller items are on this table here. Ties, handkerchiefs, braces, gloves, etc., etc. Great heavens. That's our stock, every bit of it. Look, the labels are still inside the cars and inside the suits. Whatever was he about to do? Start a haberdashery of his own? With our stock? Well, there's a great deal more than this fellow's residence, which may be stolen merchandise. At this moment, we have no way of knowing. If you were me, Inspector, you'd know. 
case of the Crown versus John Powell came under my gavel at the Old Bailey. And the facts were clear. And when I had studied what lay before me, it was evident. The accused Powell had a long history of theft and had been arrested on suspicion very often. This was the first time, it appeared, he had been actually caught in the act. The jury retired to consider the verdict, returned, pronounced Powell guilty. It's all a mistake. That's what I say, Your Worship. I didn't mean to take anything from Mr. Brown's at all. How can removing six boxes of shirts be a mistake? Come now, Powell. This isn't the first time, you know. Well, I thought the boxes were empty. You thought the boxes were empty? Yes, Your Worship. If you thought they were empty, why didn't you leave them in the alley behind the brown haberdashery to be removed by the ash man? It's a long story, Your Worship. Oh, it always is. Powell, you are apprehended at a considerable distance from the shop where you work with six boxes of shirts under your arm. Answer yes or no. Well, I can't answer that yes or no. Can't you explain yourself, sir? It's because of my wife. She was threatening to leave me. I don't make enough money for her, and I was taking home those empty boxes to pack her things up, as she asked me. Well, I have heard some ex- Extraordinary pleadings and pretense in my day. But yours, Paul, I must say, is one of the most imaginative. Well, stand up to your punishment. You're all alike. Up with the rich, down with the poor. Kick them that try to better themselves. If you were to walk out of the old belly a free man, who did you think would employ you? A man with a record? A man found guilty of betraying his employer? You've brought this ruin upon yourself. My advice to you is to say your prayers and ask the forgiveness of the Almighty for the wicked life you've led. Now, you take their word against mine. So did the jury. I was not stealing. I am innocent. It was all a mistake. The record states your flat is filled with such mistakes. I bought all that stuff. She wanted it and I bought it. There's no proof I didn't. In this case, Mr. Powell, there is proof. I have asked the Browns if they considered dropping the charges. And they said no. An example must be made. How they turn against you. I despise them. I hate them. Do you despise and hate all your other employers from whom you stole? Nothing was ever proved. Possibly. But the accusations are here. Three pages of arrests. Each time you manage to get off. Oh. Would you mind reading all that to me, Your Worship? I think uh, I would like to know where I went wrong. <sighs> That's better. You appear to be a bit more penitent. A much better way to prepare oneself for the final punishment. <laughs> I read aloud from the long list in front of me. The prosecutor came up to the bench and informed me he would have to drop the case against Powell. I was quite taken aback. And then I realized what this clever man had done. My anger had caused me to utter a prejudicial view of the accused. I, I should have known better. A man can be held accountable only for the offence for which he is being tried. Well, it's a very sore point with me now. Imagine a magistrate of my experience being led into a mistrial. <laughs> so, I had to let Powell off. But even as I acquitted him, I knew I had not heard the last of him. <laughs> How often do you suppose that has happened? That a judge finds the constraints of the law compel him to free a man he knows is guilty. And what a strange character is this John Powell. Does he really believe in his own innocence? Or like so many unfortunates, not know the difference between right and wrong? The facts have now been set before you. What fate has ordained will unfold when I return shortly with Act Two. to the past. 
Claudius the First, emperor and historian, has written, Judex Damnatur Ubi Nosens Absolvatur. The judge is condemned when a guilty person is acquitted. No doubt these words ring in our magistrate's ear, Judge Moore, as his heart pounds, his breath gasps, and he lies on his sickbed, remembering. been more careful since the last time I'd had an attack of my heart. I, I've been pushing myself too hard. Too many cases, one right after the other, and now this one. This man, Powell, as I was told later, my acquittal of the accused did not sit well with the plaintiffs, Mr. and Mrs. Brown. I've never heard of such a thing. The injustice of it. He's been stealing from us for months. We finally catch him at it. And then because of some technicality, the judge lets him go. Uh, the law is the law, I suppose. I was surprised, too. But now that man is free to roam the streets and steal whenever he's a mind to. Puzzling to me, too, Margaret. Judge Moore is called the hanging judge of Holborn. Well, he's been known to sentence a man to the scaffold for stealing one penny. I tell you this. If the law is that helpless, I am not. I'm going to see to it that every shopkeeper in London is told what a thief Jack Powell is. He will never work again in this city. Oh, no, 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 Margaret. Isn't that going a bit far? Where is your heart? I shall make quite certain that man is never employed again. Margaret Brown made good her threat. Most of these haberdashers know one another, and after being turned away from job after job... John Powell began to realize why. In his strange way, he felt as unjustly done by as the man he'd robbed. An eye for an eye, then. A tooth for a tooth. If Edgar Brown and his wife had set about destroying Powell's reputation, he would take steps to destroy theirs. Uh, Margaret. Uh, Margaret, come here. What is it? Oh, the mail's come. Read this. What? Tradesman Bank, High Holborn, London. Dear Mr. Brown, your request to us to extend your loan for another year has been denied. Moreover, we call your attention that you are defaulting payments, therefore the loan has become due and payable in full upon demand. Unless the payments are received by Monday next, we intend to bring suit against you for the full amount of the loan. Edgar, what does this mean? I, I don't understand it. All the tradesmen deal with that bank. My reputation is secure. Ours is one of the best shops. We have the finest clientele. They must know I'm good for the money. Why would they do this? You must go immediately to the bank and talk to them. I shall be here waiting for you. Margaret, I'm back. What did they say? Oh, Maggie... I don't know what to do. Well, begin by sitting down and catching your breath. No, it's, it's, it's no use. I explained to the bank manager who has suffered extraordinary losses and only recently discovered an employee who was the cause of it. He says this was not only the bank's attitude, but some of our suppliers as well. What suppliers? Some of the firms we buy from, the wholesalers, they got in touch with Tradesman's Bank asking about our credit. Well, why would they do that? It's Capitalists to shirt people? Yes, and Anthony's and Willard Brothers, all of them. But they've been our friends for years. Why did they ask the bank about our credit? But I told the manager that, and he said, Mr. Brown, personal friendships are one thing, but business is business. I pressed him to know what had happened after all these years. Well, finally, I got him to tell me that certain letters had been received by our creditors and by the bank from someone, and they wouldn't say who knowing that we were overextended, would not be able to pay our bills, so the alarm went out. What it amounts to, Maggie, is that they've lost their confidence in us. Unfortunately, the Browns had no way of meeting the obligation. They tried here, there, explained, promised, but to no avail. All their years of toil and effort were for nothing. But Edgar Brown was not the sort of an Englishman who gave up easily. Margaret, 
I met Mr. Cleveland today in Regent's Park. Haven't you anything better to do than stroll about London? You should be looking for work every moment. Oh, Mr. Cleveland's an American. He used to come into the shop. He always liked what we sold. Well, he was disappointed to hear that we'd gone bankrupt. I wish you wouldn't say that word. You know it upsets me. But I have good news. Well, of a sort. I told Mr. Cleveland all about our unfortunate experience with the bank and our suppliers. I don't think it's right you're telling every stranger of our trouble. But he's no stranger, Margaret. He's a friend. I, I was quite frank with you how unhappy we were to live in a city where an anonymous letter bears more weight than the word of a hard-working man. And he said, uh, Mr. Cleveland did, why don't you emigrate to America? In his town of Boston, there's a great demand for haberdashers who know their trade. And he gave me his card, and he made me promise if we should decide to pull up stakes and go to Boston to look him up. Boston? America? Yes, that's where it is. So I was thinking, why stay on here? Mr. Cleveland said America's a friendly place, and people there will be helpful. And then what do you think he said? What? I'll advance you the steamship ticket, he said, you and your wife. But the man is practically a stranger. Bless my soul, that man's a better friend than those we've known for years. So what say, lass? Huh? Shall we do it? America? Oh, yes, Edgar. To leave behind us that... that one thing that's been worrying me. What one thing? Who was it? Who wrote those horrible letters to the bank and the others? It must have been someone who knew us very well. Yes. Someone who hated us. Lucky Land Casino. Asking people, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kid's PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. As nearly as I've been able to piece the story together... A short time afterwards, Mr. and Mrs. Brown packed their belongings and made for Plymouth, from which the boat was to sail the following day for Boston. But they had to wait. Five days went by and the boat did not sail. A frequent occurrence on emigrant ships. Not anticipating such a delay, the Browns were practically down to their last penny. Margaret, good news. The boat sails today. Oh, thanks for good Lord. I hate Plymouth. I thought we'd never leave this place. So why do you say that? I've always loved the sea. <laughs> My parents have been to live in the city. So I wouldn't mind living in a seaport one bit. I can't stand the sound of those seagulls night and day and that smell. Well, you shan't have to listen to them anymore. I just spoke with the ship's master and he says we sail today. Oh, I don't think I could have stood it any longer. Oh, Margaret, dearest. Thank you, Mrs. Seaport. They've probably got seagulls and salt air there, too. Well, it isn't that so much, really. Oh, no, I'm not going to say anything. I'll just put it down to these be Irish and see things that aren't there. Well, Maggie, lass, sometimes you are a bit on the uh, nervous side. Do you know me? You don't know. You haven't seen or felt anything. But what is there? You haven't sensed anything. What are you trying to say, Margaret? Someone... He's watching us. Oh, come along with you. I mean it. Wherever I go, I feel those eyes on me. I see something evil. I know it. Sometimes out the corner of my eye, I see someone in the hall by our room. On the stairs. What time do we sail? With the time. About seven o'clock to see. Oh, another whole day cooped up in this awful place. I can't stand it. Well, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll take you down to the boat this morning. Uh, the captain said we could go aboard any time we wish. Now, the dock is only a minute from the inn. You find our cabin and you make yourself at home. It's going to be our home for a month, you know. Walk yourself about on the deck. Now, I'll come back here and pay the innkeeper, Mr. Ferris. We'll settle our bill, close up our trunks, and in an hour or so, I'll join you aboard. Oh, dear, 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 thank you. Perhaps I am being silly and superstitious. Oh, come along. When you go where fetch a traveling box and I'll walk into this ship. I left the trunk open in the room. I'll be sure to close it tight. Oh. What? what is it, Margaret? Oh, I'm all right. It's 
Mother. Oh, it's, it's just not another hot goblin, I hope. Edgar, I might as well tell you. I'm going to have a baby. Oh, my darling Margaret. I've been carrying it for three months and I didn't even know. Oh, my darling, darling. I, I saw a doctor before I left London. He said I was fine. And you never told me. <laughs> oh, this is the most wonderful thing. Just think of it. The three of us starting a new life in a new world. <laughs> So Margaret went aboard the ship, and Edgar went to pay his bill. The innkeeper noticed he'd barely enough pound shillings and pence to pay in full. And when Edgar returned to his room, he was surprised to find the door open. He closed the trunk, locked it, put it on his shoulders, and left the inn by the back door. Uh, Mr. Brown! Uh, Mr. Brown, would you wait a moment, please? Oh, Mr. Ferris, uh, didn't I pay you the correct amount for our lodgings? Would you mind very much, sir, if uh, we went back to the inn for a few minutes? Um, no, no, I don't suppose so. I'd like to talk to you for a moment or so. <laughs> Not at all. I certainly can't stand here in the street with a trunk on my back and do much talking. Uh, well, what is it? I don't want to be too long. My, my wife will be worried. There's been some trouble... And since you were just going out the back way... What? What trouble? What's it got to do with me? Well, our waiter, sir. He's just been to see me, and he said you were leaving by the rear door with your trunk, and... Yes, yes, so I was, so I was. It's a quicker road in the dark, and our trunk is not too light, you know. Now, where, where shall I set it down? Right here, sir. In the front hall. Oh, back. Yeah. <sighs> well, now. Now, what's... What's all this about your waiter? Well, he made such a point of saying it was the back door you were leaving by. Ah, uh, well, yes, I know what's bothering him. As you saw, Mr. Ferris, I had barely enough money to take care of our bill. I'm afraid the tip I gave the waiter was a bit niggardly. Well, he didn't mention that, sir. But he wanted to know whether you paid your bill, seeing as how you were leaving the back way. <laughs> Then the maid came down and said the gentleman in number 17 had just had his gold watch stolen. Well, what has that got to do with me? Now, please, Mr. Brown, I'd like to keep this quiet. You are keeping me from boarding my ship. Now, what has this, this wretched theft of a watch got to do with me? Number 17 is next to number 19, which was your room, sir. I very much regret detaining you, but I do have to search everyone here. Surely, Mr. Brown... Since you are just leaving, you would have no objection to being searched first, and then you can go. There now. The trunk is unlocked and open, so search away. Oh, I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, but, uh, careful not to mess up the clothes, please. Oh, what is this? Who, who put it there? Who has done this to me? Mr. Brown, dear me. I know nothing as to how that watch came into my trunk. I do not know anything. Mr. Brown, this concerns the honor of my house. You understand, if word of such thieving got about, who would feel safe here? I tell you, I know nothing about how that gold watch got into my trunk. Oh, ill advise. I know, Mr. Brown, you are very low in funds. But this, I'm afraid you shall have to go before a magistrate. Oh, yes, by all means. Take me to the magistrate instantly, and let's have this diabolical plot unraveled. I welcome inquiry into my character and conduct, you hear? I did not take that watch and place it in my trunk, and God is my witness. I'm afraid we shall have to ring down the curtain for a few minutes. Just when accusations are flying, the mystery is deepening, and the very life of poor Edgar Brown may be in jeopardy. And the ship he and his wife were to take may sail without them in a matter of hours. But take heart, in only a matter of minutes, I shall return with Act Three. This same Emperor Claudius, whom we quoted earlier, and uh, this time I shall not speak the Latin, but only the translation, has written, The Law Being a Tyrant compels many things to be done contrary to nature. Such as, for instance, claiming the life of a man as suitable punishment for stealing. For that was the barbarous criminal code of those days. Is that to be Edgar Brown's fate? Uh, come in. Mr. Hatfield, I hope I don't disturb you. Oh, not at all, Mr. Ferris. 
Well, you have a problem, I take it. And so you seek out that uh, one of your guests, who is an attorney, myself. Uh, am I right? Uh, Mr. Hatfield, it is not for myself. Uh, I am presuming upon your kindness, but since it does happen you are a member of the legal profession, I thought perhaps you might be of help. That's what I told Mrs. Brown. Ah, yes, that would be the wife of the accused Brown who is a guest here. <laughs> I'm told he is fully committed for trial next month. Very distressing case, sir. Very strange indeed. Uh, what are you asking me to do, Ferris? If you would be so good as to see her. Well, by all means, have her in. Mrs. Brown, uh, Mr. Hatfield will see you. Thank you. Good day, Mr. Hatfield. Ah, uh, please take a chair, Mrs. Brown. I shall leave you now, sir. Mr. Hatfield, you are an attorney? Well, just beginning, I'm afraid. Going on my first circuit. <laughs> I confess to you, I have not been honored by more than three or four briefs. I don't understand that innkeeper at all. First, he accuses my husband of theft and has taken him before a magistrate. Then, when my husband is falsely imprisoned, he offers to find me an attorney. Uh, Mrs. Brown, you have to understand, Mr. Ferris was defending the good name of his inn. The gentleman who suffered the loss of his watch did, I believe, threaten legal proceedings against this house. It's done now, and I do thank you for your patience, Mr. Hatfield. I am beside myself with anxiety. I, I know no one in Plymouth, and I have no money to pay you. Well, I... I get a great many cases like that, Mrs. Brown. But when one begins in the law, that is to be expected. I don't know what to do. I'm alone. The boat has gone off. It's still to America without us. My husband in a jail cell. Where do I turn? And there is something quite inexplicable here. And I don't know yet what to make of it. Your husband, Mrs. Brown, and forgive me for asking this, has he always borne a good character? Oh, yes. Perfectly so. In his business, it came to nothing that was unfortunate in that, too. How that happened is as great a mystery as the gold watch in the trunk. Mm. Uh, where are you staying? Mr. Ferris is kind of let me stay on here. Good, good. Uh, keep up your spirits, Mrs. Brown, and I shall pursue this as thoroughly as I can. Just try to hold on to hope. You have only each other to think of. There are going to be three of us, Mr. Hatfield. I'm to have a baby. We were so hoping our first child would be born in a new world. Mind what life does to you. We were doing so well, Edgar and I, until we took on that assistant. I shall begin immediately, Mrs. Brown, by talking to the innkeeper. When you leave, would you be good enough to ask Mr. Ferris to join me? What worries me, Ferris, is the fact that Judge Moore will be on the bench. I've seen him in his black robes, putting on the black cap to render sentence. He is very severe, and if exculpatory evidence fails to materialize... Excuse me, Mr. Hatfield. What was that word? Uh, if evidence that will explain the presence of the watch in Mr. Brown's trunk is not found, then Mr. Brown runs a grave risk of <clears throat> the ultimate penalty. Of course... I didn't go into that with his wife. But I thought hanging was at the discretion of the judge. Is it a law? Death for theft? Well, let us suppose Mr. Brown is innocent. What do I have to go on? Mrs. Brown's assurance that her husband is of good character. <laughs> but good character, by the law of England, goes for nothing when the Crown presents facts to the jury. You believe he's innocent? He's my client. Of course I do. This is not a simple case, nor will it be heard by a simple judge. Judge Moore is himself a man of spotless character, and word has it that it is no extraordinary thing for him to sentence 20 men to hang at Newgate before lunch. Gentlemen of the jury, may I point out... There is a total want of any direct evidence of the prisoner's guilt. Mr. Hatfield, you will kindly address the bench and the bench only. Uh, your worship, I beg forgiveness. I forgot myself. I submit the alleged guilt of the accused... ...has not been proven to your satisfaction, Mr. Hatfield. Well, it has to mine. Does he accuse me, Mr. Arrete? What's his name again? Oh, yes, yes. Mr. Angus Brown. No, Edgar. Edgar Brown. Does he have any statement to make before I address the jury? I know, Your Worship. 
Mr. Brown reserves that privilege after verdict has been reached. By then, it may be too late. Foreman, has the jury arrived at a verdict? We have, Your Worship. The prisoner will stand and face the jury. Foreman, how do you find the prisoner? Guilty as shot. All right, we have any help. We will have no more such disturbances. <clears throat> prisoner, approach the bench. Have you anything to urge why the sentence of death should not be passed upon you? Oh, I could say much, Sir Hangman Judge, why the sentence should not be pronounced. Someone, some person on this earth has sought me out to deliberately ruin me forever. And hand in hand with him are yourselves, jury and judge. Life or death at your bidding. A privilege belonging only to God. Prisoner at the bar! I cannot listen to such observations. You have been found guilty by a jury of your countrymen. With that finding, I entirely agree. I warn you, Sir Death, and it is a voice from the tomb, that all of you are about to commit a most cruel and deliberate murder. I will not have such words spoken here. It is the law. Not the jury or ourselves that pass the sentence. You, sir, prisoner, Edgar Brown, from your habits and education, you should have been above committing so base a crime. However, now you must pay with your presence on the scaffold. No, no, no. My lord, before the leaves fall from the trees, you will be struck down and fall also. You will appear at the bar of another world to answer for the innocent life. My life, which you have cast away. Take him from me. You will die, and you just... You will die. I know it. A month later, on a Monday, the noose was tightened about Edgar Brown's neck. That morning, I couldn't rise from my bed. I felt a choking sensation... The very instant he dropped through the trap door. All day, and for many days, I could hear the words, You will die. After spring came summer. Then the leaves began to turn. The circuit took me to the west of England, where a certain John Powell had been put in chains for robbing a farmer of eight shillings. The prisoner will approach the bench do you have anything to say before the sentence of death is passed upon you? I most certainly do. There's a great deal on my mind, Your Lordship. You may remember Edgar Brown, my lord, whom you hanged on the first day of spring. What of him, fellow? Why, my lord, only this. He was as innocent of the crime for which you hanged him as a child unborn. A child unborn to Mrs. Brown, I might add. Hmm, human... Monstrous villain! I was there at the assizes. I heard you, my lord. Society would be dissolved if an innocent man were not hanged. A human life for a gold war. Remove the prisoner! That was yesterday. I fainted. My heart almost stopped. I was put to bed. And I lie here now, remembering. This morning I feel better. To be a judge on behalf of the Crown is my calling. It is my mission in life to rid the world of such scum as this, this power animal. Oh, I can see through him. He plots for a mistrial. Ha! There will be no mistrial. I shall rise from bed, and at ten this morning I will render the sentence. Prisoner, you will stand to hear our sentence. I am not finished, my lord. Finished? Oh, yes, you are. I had not said all I wished to say. This uh, poor Brown, I stole from him. And yet, you, yes, it was you who freed me. Freedom. Oh, it helped me not. No one would employ me. My wife left me. So I said about my kind of justice. I wrote letters to his creditors. 
frightened him, caused his bankruptcy. But even that was not enough for me. The madness of my revenge would not stop. I followed him to Plymouth. And when my chance came, put that watch in his trunk. <laughs> it was I. It was sweet when he was jailed for theft as I was jailed. But Edgar Brown was not as fortunate as I, my lord. Judge Moore, the same hanging judge, would not let him off. <laughs> the prisoner will, will be quiet. So the so sentence can, can be... You know, my lord, that Mrs. Brown destroyed herself. The coroner's jury said she'd fallen accidentally into the water, the bay at Plymouth, into the sea that she hoped would carry them to a new life. Drowned herself? Killed herself with a newborn in her arms. I saw her corpse with the dead infant. And then I knew that I was lost. <laughs> Doomed to everlasting hell. But you and I, your lordship, shall go down together. No more hangings for you. <laughs> we are both prisoners. Stand up, your lordship, and be judged at the bar. Stand up and be judged. Those were the last words Judge Moore heard on earth. He cried out and pitched forward across the bench. His heart had given out. Can you imagine that not so long ago, stealing was punishable by hanging? How far have we come that even murder itself today does not warrant the death sentence? A few more thoughts on this subject when I return shortly. One last return to the philosophic Emperor Claudius, who wrote, Justice is pictured wearing a blindfold so that she cannot see the injustice practiced in her name. I said when we began, I hoped that by pointing a finger at our past, we might be the wiser and seek to improve the present. And all of us can. Our cast included Court Benson, Terry Keene, Earl Hammond, and William Griffiths. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account. Where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC.